uh, one time. So I'm going to start recording real quick. <clears throat> okay, there we go. Um, I just wanted to point out the plan. You know, I like to uh, see where we are, where we're going, where we've been uh, every meeting, as you know. And uh, where we are today, we're going to talk about mixed effects models. I've just been talking about mixed effects models. I think the zip should have popped up with the slides I'll go through for my part. What has happened for this is my way of thinking on this, we have talked about mixed effects models in the past. You'll remember we started reading a book and we went through about the first six or seven chapters of it. It's been a bit more than a year now. There, There is a collection of those meetings, some with videos and, um, and PDFs from the book that we went through. And I'll refer to that particular book and some other resources at the end of this. But, you know, I observe over time that um, linear mixed effects models are, are, I get questions a lot. And uh, so I thought it was time with a, with a recent example from uh, one of our participants, Anna Pradaberio, to um, yeah, just use, uh, use this as an example, point out some opportunities for best practice uh, and, and point out some good resources. So uh, Anna is gonna introduce this long-term experiment. It's here at Harper, it's a well-known experiment. It's just gonna explain the data. Then I'm gonna give a little bit of a um, blast about linear mixed effects models and do some live coding to just, just look at it. This is a nice data set because it's a clear and well-motivated experiment, very nice experiment. Um, and also because it's a relatively simple application, a rel relatively simple example. But, but yet, as you'll see, there are some subjective aspects to analyzing even the simplest data set. So uh, I thought this was a good good thing to talk about. Anna, would you like to um, show us your slides and tell us about the data? Uh, yes, I'm going to thank you, Ed. Let me share the screen. Is this one? Mm. Oops, sorry. Here. Okay. Is it working? Okay. Yes, it works perfect. See it fine. Okay. So yeah, um, this is a long-term fuel experiment, as you mentioned. It was established in 2011 in a field called Large Mars at Harper Adams University, and uh, it consists of a randomized block design with four replicated blocks. And I have another slide here where you can see the blocks better. Uh, so this block design is to account uh, for the special variability of the soil because block four has a slightly more sandy, rocky soil than the rest. And uh, each block has nine plots. Each plot is about four meters wide and 80 meters long. And it plot has a combination of one of these two traffic or tillage treatments. We have three traffic treatments, a standard type pressure, low tire pressure, and controlled traffic farming. This is a system that it confines all the wheels uh, from vehicles to the least possible area of permanent traffic lanes. And then we have three tillage treatments, deep tillage that goes up to 25 centimeters, shallow tillage that goes up to 10 centimeters, and a no till that has no tillage at all. Um, so here we can also see in block one uh, all the plots with the different tillage. Uh, first is the traffic, and then is the tillage treatments. And for the data that we are looking today, I wanted to see if the different traffic and tillage treatments had any effect of the, on the soil organic matter content. And for this, I took two samples per plot and I separated them for three different depths, uh, 0 to 10 centimeters, 10 to 20, and 20 to 30 centimeters. And then I also put them together and sieve them to homogenize uh, the sample. 
and I wanted to look at uh, to see if there are any significant differences between treatments, but also to see the block aspect and the death, if it has any effect. This is more or less. <laughs> OK, that's good. That, that, that kind of okay. throws it out there. That throws it out there. Thank you. That's just fine. That's exactly what I expected. Thank you for that. OK. I'm going to seize the screen back and just launch into this so that we have enough time to just discuss things today. I'm going to maybe change my to the laser pointer. I like to draw on things, so I think I'll take the pin today. OK, so um, <clears throat> this is just a refresher for people who haven't seen this before, and I'm really going to go fast and talk conceptually about some of the things that we've talked over time here before and uh, just to start it off if if you haven't been to some of these um, other meetings where we've talked about mixed effects before I'll start off with a um, with a um, kind of uh, inciting claim here on the on the title slide that you know if you have have had a first statistics class at some point in the past and we haven't talked about mixed effects before probably is the case that there's been a lie of omission in your education so far because we start off teaching these first statistics class um, kind of uh, um, modules by by presenting statistical models that are only fixed effects what we might call fixed effects things we manipulate in an experiment or covariates that are observational but actually there are other kinds of effects. Um, you may have encountered them called repeated measures or um, or some other kind of uh, correlation structure for something that you sample repeatedly, say through time or uh, within the same field or area of the field. We call those random effects so that models combining both uh, are called mixed effects models. So that's what we're going to talk about. Now, if uh, any of you were there, and I know a couple of you were from my talk yet, uh, Monday, um, you would recognize this slide. I've just got a couple from that slide, so hopefully you won't be bored for too long in this talk. But um, this is a way to organize our mind about um, the way that statistics practice is changing. Uh, we have these traditional so-called traditional methods. Now, this isn't all of the traditional methods but it is uh, possibly some of the tra traditional methods. Tests like ANOVA, the analysis of variance, simple linear regression, also these simple non-parametric tests and our old favorite like the t-test. Um, this is a survey of papers. Uh, this is in ecology, but this would hold true. You'd find similar findings in any, any quantitative field these days. We might call these the traditional statistics and um, the new statistics are uh, things like the generalized linear model and mixed effects models. Um, this proc mixed uh, refers to a particularly popular scripting statistical software package called SAS. It's been around longer than R, still going strong, but the R has become more popular than SAS. Um, and my, the maximum likelihood approach to comparing models. And uh, again, I showed this slide a couple days ago that the point of this in this review is that for these traditional techniques, if we look from the year um, 1990 up to about 2015 in a, in a random sample of representative um, papers looking at the quantitative methods used, we see that all of these traditional techniques are, are holding their own. Some are more common than others, ANOVA is, and the um, uh, is still very common and very popular, but um, and the other ones are as well, plus simple linear regression t-tests and so forth. These newer methods, though, are increasing in the frequency that they're showing up. They're probably showing up. Uh, what I've observed in my own practice is that um, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, when I would uh, when I would be called in and somebody would say, "Our data are really bad. Would you help us?" And I would come in and say, oh, yeah, you use this fancy new thing called the generalized linear model. And I would do it. And they'd say, yeah, but could you also do 
the old fashioned test and we'll put both of them side by side just for those reviewers that that don't know about these these new tests. And I, I think for a while it, it was and still is common in some journals for um, the old fashioned test that probably violates the assumptions and the newer generalized linear model framework to be reported side by side, or at least to say that we did the old fashioned test too. One of the biggest, uh, I don't know if I would refer to this as a contest where there are winners and losers, but one of certainly by the metrics uh, that these guys found and in my observation, one of the, the big increases in popularity and utility and importance in the tools in our toolbox is the, the mixed effects model, the generalized linear mixed effects model. So we can see over this time period that they reviewed that the use of mixed effects models is increasing. That means that if you're skilling up at any point in your career, you uh, to be able to to adjudicate evidence that's presented to you in journal articles, you need to know about this. And and also, of course, if you're going to generate your own evidence, you'll need to know about it too. So I'll I'll go over some of those things here directly. And then the last one, also because this the role of Herrig here at Harper Adams um, plays uh, a part in in the um, optional elective um, training for for um, research students and uh, this is just uh, looking at the formal training that is offered where is my my um, my clicker there for uh, for this for this bar these would be research programs where um, no formal training was listed and the green bar which uh, this this bar is all green is uh, training up to linear models. So by default, if there's nothing listed, it would it would be um, the uh, old fashioned traditional methods. Uh, for those uh, about a quarter of the studies that did have a uh, stats training requirement, um, only a, a small proportion of them um, went beyond linear models, for example, to the to the mixed effects models. And then there were quite a lot um, of uh, programs that uh, about half uh, and about half of the ones that had an op had optional training like like I think that we would describe our program as having optional training and some of that optional training would include um, modern modern models so we would probably be up here um, now two two mixed effects models I want to say right from the beginning that um, oftentimes when I work with these things on people that uh, they'll bring a data set and they'll say how do you analyze this data set but actually with random effects and lots of other of other um, kinds of statistical models I consider uh, them to be a design choice something that um, we design the data collection for we think about it before we collect any data to do it so um, I know that uh, I know that that is a hard thing to say I like to give solutions rather than problems when when I try to help people but really that's best practice so um, so having said that um, we have a different kinds if we were thinking uh, either after we have some data or if we were thinking of of some data, um, we might, in the very general sense, have some some area within which we would do plots. So one of these is is just a single point of sampling. We could be sampling anything. This is just a generalized diagram. Maybe this is an experiment with a treatment factor that has a control and a manipulation variable. And here um, there's a spatial component. I've drawn it as if it were a field and we were looking from the top down. And uh, maybe this is random sampling, completely random. We've got an equal sample size for some control and an equal sample size for some manipulation. And, you know, that is one kind of design, another kind of design. What if we were worried a little bit that there was some factor that was uncontrolled spatially um, that maybe it had to do with soil or maybe it had to do with drainage or something like that. 
And uh, we had the same experiment here, same sample size, but now I've drawn this so that the um, individual samples are paired with each other. And we can use a, a paired um, statistical model design. We could use the traditional one, like a paired t-test for this particular design, or we could use a linear mixed effects model. Really common trial, and one that fits Anna's data that she just told you about, is um, one that's got some jargon with it. And here we might um, we might have a spatial component. And uh, um, farmers, the way that modern farming practice happens, would find it um, possibly possibly uh, hard just logistically to to have those random paired plots to do something different in um, plots that were close to each other. And often um, this uh, so-called blocked design is one where you take large areas that can be handled practically by farmer or by um, uh, scientists in a farming setting uh, where they can just be practically handled and samples can be manipulated within them. And th this is a kind of design. There are some jargon terms I'll try to avoid here for various variations on this. This is the last uh, conceptual slide that I'll show. But uh, within this, you would replicate, uh, you can think of it as replicating the um, different combinations of your treatment within each block. And we might refer to each of the blocks as a replica of of all combinations of the experiment. And we, we could have more sampling within um, within each each block, like, like Anna's um, data set has, than this. This is just a diagram. So this is called a block design, and it's a tradition for field um, trials, and uh, especially in an agriculture setting for field experiments. And so a lot of you probably know that. But uh, a thing that that I think I want to encourage you to think about, if you haven't already thought about this, is that actually from each of these designs and all the variations thereof, uh, we learn different things. Um, so I don't consider, uh, and we could spend an awful lot of time, way, and we have spent in the past in here a lot of um, time talking about how they differ and what the different kinds of inter information that are generated from these and similar designs, what what that um, what those differences are, but I think the thing I want to emphasize today is that this is not a a technician's decision. After all, the the data are collected, not ideally anyway. Um, instead, it's uh, it's an intellectual uh, decision that uh, that should be made when uh, you're planning the experiment and you design the uh, the evidence that you wish to generate. Now, um, there are some cases where this is not possible, like with the example that we have today. Uh, it, it wasn't possible for Anna um, and, and probably not possible for her supervisors to, um, to consider this because this particular experiment was established a very long time ago. Uh, so there are some cases where we, the best we can do is to just think about these issues um, at this stage, and that's what we're doing here. Now, it turns out that, um, and I just want to look in my um, participants list here and see if uh, by chance Joe Collins is in here. I don't see him in here. That, that's, um, that's a pity, but I'll, uh, I'll tell him that this has been recorded because um, I found this particular figure recently when I was, um, when I was um, talking with, uh, with a PhD student here, Joe Collins. He, he often comes to these meetings. And um, what this figure shows is it is an example of a spatial uh, variation in a in a field in an agricultural habitat. I like the this is from a book, and I'll I'll tell you the citation in a few slides. But it's a very good book. It's a very modern book from a statistical theory perspective. Thanks, Martin. Um, uh, Joe does come regularly, so uh, but thanks for telling me that. Um, but this is a very common issue in uh, in field trials like this. And this top panel up here shows uh, well what the what the data are 
is a um, is a uh, there there are three fields of data shown in this top top figure up here. So the uh, the first two fields are the um, so-called northing on the y-axis. So uh, and uh, a y-axis linear measure of of uh, how far um, north from the equator this uh, this um, study was conducted and the easting is how far from the meridian uh, it um, uh, it was conducted and it's just a way to to um, plot those x and y data now the the shading is a measure of the um, clay content as a percent in the soil spatially in this field and we have a scale over here and um, this bottom graph shows exactly the same data set. The only difference between these two is that um, uh, at each of these black points, uh, these little dots that are on the systematic grid overlaying the plot, there was a sample taken of the soil and the clay content was measured. And for the top graph, uh, a technique called Krieging was used to extrapolate the variation in clay content between those points and to create this um, this um, this heat map of clay content that you see the darker the um, the darker the uh, the um, coloration there the higher the percentage uh, clay down here on the bottom the way this was handled is that um, spatially a, a block was uh, identified emanating around the point that was taken and you know here we just have um, whatever the point was we assume that all points close to it will be the same well um you know we could do this for anything uh that we might um that we might um that we might measure in a field so it could be something like uh, electrical conductivity could be something like the grain yield and we'd want to do something like this and this is um, something from remote sensing i think it's just the reflectance in the infrared band uh, so we could go crazy with this and there's a whole um a whole area of statistics um that is uh that is to do with this but you know if we uh before i go on to that one if if we can't measure um things that we know might affect our experiment like clay like um like the electrical conductivity, like the soil moisture, um, things like that. The way we handle that is is by designing our experiments in blocks. And Anna said, I think it was um, number four, block four that had sandy soil. So we would expect the drainage to be different there. And the things that you measure, like the organic uh, matter in the soil, which is her dependent variable today, might be different because of these spatial characteristics. Okay. Now, um, I've drawn some just cartoon diagrams of um, <clears throat> of how we think of fixed and uh, random effects. And I've, I've drawn it not with an ANOVA style uh, set of data here, but this is just a simple linear regression where we might have something down here on the x-axis uh, that is an explanatory variable and something on the y-axis that's a dependent variable. And uh, in a simple linear regression, we would call this a all fixed effects linear model. And uh, we would estimate a line of prediction. Uh, as you know, we've done this many, many times and all of you can, can uh, tackle this kind of problem. But um, what we're talking about here is something fundamentally different. What if what if we had a different scenario where we had, um, you know, in a way, if the fixed variable has uh, some kind of um, different average representation by block? Uh, let's say the simplest case scenario would be that the uh, the the mean the mean um, value of the fixed variable here differs by the two blocks well we could we could account for this uh, in what we would call a, a fixed plus a random intercept model this is the basic um, kind of mixed effects model and um, 
this is the kind that I'm going to analyze with the example data set. And we make an assumption here about that variation. It's, it's called a um, random intercept model because it allows the intercept of these, um, of these two estimators to be independent of one another. They're independently estimated based just on the subset within the block. But you know, the slopes you'll notice here are represented as exactly the same. These lines are parallel. And this isn't a random slope model. This is a fixed slope model. That's a one slope that's estimated for all the data. And what this assumes is that the relationship between the fixed and the dependent variable is the same in those different blocks, but that the, the mean representation of the fixed variable is what differs. Of course, um, we have talked about this in here. We, we can have random intercept and random slope at the same time, uh, where the, the fundamental nature of the relationship also um, changes. Now, in practice, um, we would have a theoretical reason to to uh, challenge data with with one of these models, and, and we in practice usually would not. Um, we would not uh, uh, interrogate the data and and compare both of these models as if we didn't know which one we expected. We typically would not do that. It's possible to do. It's very possible to test all possible models, as you know. It's just not good practice to do so. It's it's better to have an idea of what you're testing and then be a little more specific if you can be with what you're testing. Now, I'm just going to go back to this slide one more time is, is that um, I, I haven't actually talked about this a lot to people that come to me with data. I usually I usually judge this on my own. The judgment that I usually make is whether or not there's a an obvious or or whether it's communicated to me that there's a reason to believe that the nature of that relationship differs between the blocks and and often in designed experiments, it doesn't. The default is we do random intercept only. Okay, we have looked at both of these with some of those examples in the um, Alan Zur's book, the uh, mixed effects models and extensions in ecology book. A few further remarks before we go on. Um, it's it's widely accepted. Uh, well, one of my favorite. Um, professional statisticians that um, works in in agriculture. He's dead now, actually, uh, even though he's not not as old as the real classic statisticians is George Casella. And he wrote a really good modern book on um, experimental design, which I encountered uh, as a as a young statistician. I was interested in um, more in animal designs and um, human clinical designs when I read this book. And and I found myself constantly translating the examples um, that he would tend to, to give to uh, to that. It's it's mathematical, so I, I've I've never um, I've never um, suggested it in here, but uh, you can find his books. But um, what um, Casella would say is that blocks are are always best treated as random effects. They're always best treated as random effects. We don't even have to think about this. Uh, we view the blocks as, um, as and this is an important point, uh, maybe the most important point. When we have a random effects model with blocks as a random effect, we view each block as a sample of a much larger population of, of potential such blocks. Um, so we view them as representative, um, representative samples of much wider variation. This is a very important point. It's probably the most important thing that I've said in weeks in here. Um, there is a burden here. We have the five block or four blocks in this data set, and um, be because we're with random effects, because we're extrapolating on that wider population, there is a burden of replication and. This particular experiment, for all the we know the reasons that it's constrained, and we we often can't do anything about that, and like we can't for this experiment. But there is a burden of of that extrapolation, and there is a burden of that replication uh, within this kind of experiment. We're right on the edge of it with this um, data set. 
there is though there there is um in practice there is a practice for blocks to be treated as fixed effects um that could be treated as fixed effects and and uh, i wish i could tell you that one of these ways casella's way of viewing how the world works versus um alternative views and I, I don't mean these are just hackneyed alternative views i mean this is a legitimate alternative view that does show up in the applied literature um that uh, I mean, times we might do it, uh, treat a block as a fixed effect. I guess a rule to choose your random effect is um, if there's a uh, some level of variation in your data that you are interested in for biological or for um, theoretical reasons, then it's a fixed effect. This would be something like you something you manipulate in an experiment. But if it's something that you're not really interested in, the variation you're not really interested in, but instead you think there might be variation that's annoying to you, like the variation that might be uh, in the soil characteristics of a whole field where you're trying to do some real science, that's annoying variation. And uh, when it's annoying variation, we control for it statistically by treating it as a random effect. So that's that's kind of a way to make the decision up for yourself. A um, few final remarks before we look at the code. One remark that I've said a number of times is that um, the modern statistics and linear mixed effects models are, are very complicated and they're hard. Uh, I also wanna say that, that they're easy to perform we can easily perform them in R. We have done it so many times in here, but um, but actually there's a lot underneath the hood. It, it may be part of me, maybe it's the mean part of me, wants to say that they're too easy, um, but conceptually I don't think they're easy. And so uh, it's just a little bit of a reminder to myself to uh, to let's treat these things with care. The other thing is that, um, to design experiments and to um, perform them, it requires two kinds of expertise. And um, it is very difficult for both of these kinds of expertise to be contained within the same individual all the time. So it contains deep knowledge and understanding of the subject material. You need to be a subject expert and know what to expect, what to predict. You need to know how the system works. You need to have a um, strong theoretical motivation for that evidence generation criteria that I, that I mentioned a few minutes ago. But also it requires statistical expertise. And we all work on both of these things for our whole career, no matter what your primary thing is, we all work on both of these things. And it, and it helps um, no matter what you do to just talk about this stuff like we're doing here. So that's that's how we mitigate that. We we communicate it, get feedback and take it on board. Um, and then the last thing is, well, we know if you're here, you've elected to come in here and engage in skill building. And then the book that we read before, at least we started reading it, we didn't quite finish it. This is an applied stats textbooks very very popular especially amongst um ecologists uh, and applied ecologists and it's just written in plain language lots of really good examples the best thing about this book is that the data sets are absolutely filthy they're just like real data sets they, they have even errors in the data that are in the r package uh, the r package has gone extinct from <laughs> From this book, uh, you might remember it had gone extinct a couple of years ago when we did it. Alan, who is a friend of mine, the lead author, uh, he runs a company called Highland Statistics. Uh, he said uh, when I asked him about it, when I first noticed it, he said that it was just it was just too much work work to uh, keep the um, the uh, R package updated. But you can still download the data from the website. He also said that he intentionally left the errors in the data set, like he discusses in the book, like we discussed in here, because Every data set has errors. If you want the classic book, you want this book. It's got agricultural examples in it, but it is um, it is a bit advanced, a bit more advanced than the Zur book. But Pinheiro and Bates is the uh, mixed effects book that I encountered um, 
um, during my PhD. It was it was new when it came out then, and uh, I have used it um, almost monthly for for the past you know twenty years. It's 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 still valid. It's says mixed effects in S and S plus, but um, as you may recall, S is the precursor language to R. Um, and all of the code, or at least almost all of the code still works fine. A really popular modern stats textbook is this one by John Fox. He's got two books. One is like a, a regular textbook that's not practical. It just talks conceptually about it. It's called, um, it's called Applied Regression, I think. Uh, and he's also got this book that's uh, a very practical companion to it, the R Companion to Applied Regression. Um, and this is just a great book. A lot of the examples are um, are not in agriculture and, and ecology, but um, it is also worth having uh, on your shelf if you're if you're serious about investing in this. I think um, which one would I buy first? Um, which one would I recommend? We already have chapters of this available on links to the old Herrick website, but if anybody's interested in it and, and wants a PDF of the first few chapters, you can uh, let me know if you can't find them yourself. Um, this book is widely available online by the authors. Um, um, legally, I think. Um, this one is not available online, certainly not legally. This is a new version, but I think you could probably find the second edition still valid and still great um, for very inexpensively. And that brings us to this last book. This is a, a very modern uh, book, and I mentioned Joe Collins. Um, we were talking about some spatial data problems. Now, this isn't a, a this isn't a stats textbook for linear models. This is a spatial modeling book and they do talk about mixed effects models for um, for um, some kinds of field trials but they also call talk about modeling the uh, variance um, due to XY juxtaposition and we have also used uh, ARIMA um, error modeling in here and it's, it's pretty advanced but um, th this is an advanced textbook if you're serious about some spatial stuff in your own data and it's really good and this is the new edition that's just come out and all agriculture examples almost uh, actually they use four data sets in here two are um two are big agriculture data sets and and two are natural um habitat data sets so they use those four and every example in the book is from those four so great great textbook okay um now <clears throat> did drop the uh, zip with this stuff in the text or in the uh, chat in a zip a while back in case anybody wants to follow along now, this is a version of the um of a script that i made to explore the data set a lot of uh remember i said this stuff is subjective we talked about this a lot in here but uh I know there are a few people that haven't come to all these meetings, so um, I'm going to just not assume anything about um, remembering things that I've rambled on about in here before. A lot of this stuff is subjective, especially when we're testing competing models against the data. So I knew that we had a data set that was um, had a spatial component. I'm just going to open the Excel spreadsheet and um, just look at that real quick. These are the um, variables that Anna introduced to us. There's a, um, a block. It's a factor that has no order, and it's coded as one, two, three, four. There's a traffic, which um, I find it very challenging to remember, even though I've looked at, as, as some of you know, various versions of uh, this experiment over several years. But I find it very challenging to remember that STP stands for standard tire pressure. I've just made notes again, as Anna told us, that um, LTP is low tire pressure and uh, CTP, CTF is controlled traffic uh, something. <laughs> and the, uh, the tillage variable is uh, deep, shallow, and zero. And that, we might think of that as an ordered factor, you know, zero, shallow, deep, or the reverse. 
The OM is a numeric measurement of organic matter. And the plot is um, those plots that, that Anna showed us. Now there are 36 lines of data in this data set, no missing data. I just, you know, habitually, if it's big enough for me to scroll through in less than a minute, I'll just glance and see if I see any missing data. Um, and I usually, uh, I did go ahead and put a, a data dictionary on the second tab, like you know I like to do for this particular example. So if we go back in here, I've set this up like I like to set up my, uh, my uh, scripts and like we've practiced in here quite a lot. I'm just going to make the, um, the um, thing bigger for you here. And uh, I've got my setup section where um, I've loaded quite a lot of libraries. Um, I have done this fairly sloppily because this I've adapted this script from some uh, chats that I had with Anna before. But I've added in um, all the libraries that I might need. I haven't used all of these today. So uh, unless this were going to mutate some more in this form, I'd probably go back and clean these out for posterity. But NLME is one of the big libraries, as you know, for um, linear mixed effects models. And uh, the other one is LME4. Um, so I have both of those. And, and I use both of them, even though they do, on the surface, they do the same thing. They do them in different ways. And for some of the diagnostics, I prefer one over the other. ggplot2 makes pretty graphs. dplyr. Um, allows us to manipulate data. I don't think I've used either of those for the for this today. ggpubr is a um, is a utility. It's part of the tidy tidyverse, um, and it's used to uh, to do outputs, which I also haven't haven't done today. Um, LMER test is one that we've looked at before. You know the modern way in the modern statistics, and the guys who are uh, very famous applied statisticians who created and maintained the LME4. That's the that's the um, international standard for linear mixed effects models at the at, and it has been for many years. It came first came out around 20 years ago, as far as I know. At one point in time, when we estimated the beta coefficients in that linear model um, in the linear model equation that all of this statistical modeling is based on. When we do a, a statistical test of whether or not a variable or a factor level is significant, we're really testing whether or not that beta coefficient is different to zero. We have discussed all of this stuff in here before. I'm just passing quickly through it now. The LMER4, uh, the LMER test package, is one that um, at, at some point the the makers philosophically the um, creators of the LME4 package decided that they couldn't trust scientists with p-values for those beta coefficients because um, they were misusing p-values. There's a whole whole scientific literature on the use and misuse of p-values, which we've talked about in here. And what they decided to do controversially was they took away the automatic generation of a statistical test for those beta coefficients from the most popular package. And what the LMER test package does is it puts them back in for the rest of us, as we still do like them. VizReg is a package that visualizes um, linear models. MooMin, it's also a utility for linear models. EM Means, also a utility for linear models. It does post hoc testing. LS Means also does post hoc testing for um, non mixed effects models. MultComp and MultComp View. Um, I'll show you a little trick with MultComp down below if we have time to get to it in this script. It's a short script, so we should have time to do it in just the 15 minutes we have left. OpenXLSX allows us to read OpenXL files. Now, um, the LSR package, now this one's a new one. We haven't used that very much in here, but it's one that is is come into my daily use rotation in all my scripts. So the next time that I talk to you about your own data, you're likely to see me straight away have this in in the script um, now what it does is it has a, some utilities that are nice but the reason that i've been using it a lot lately is for linear models um, you know we've talked about statistical power and effect size many times in here and what lsr does is um, 
it allows us to calculate the linear model uh, effect size. And I'll show you how I've used that in this script, but I use it all the time for everything now. And it's so easy to use, as I'll show you. SJplot is a, um, is a, it's a fancier ggplot version of, um, of visreg. I haven't replaced my daily rotation with um, visreg is, if you've worked with me recently, you know I'm using it a lot, and I know some of you are using it too, which is fantastic for me to see. SJplot could replace could replace um, visreg for me. It's it's pretty cool. So I'll show you what what it does too. So I'm going to set the working directory, um, and I'm going to read in the data. You can look up in the global environment real quick. Three, two, one. Whoops. I've got to load these packages before I can do that, of course. So let me just load them all. Three, two, one. Takes just a second to load all of that mess in there. Get a lot of warnings because I haven't updated my my uh, I've stopped my practice of instantly updating R um, because sometimes it does actually break things, <laughs> and I've got enough um, active live scripts right now that that's too big of a risk for me to take. So here comes the data up in the global environment. Keep your eyes there. Three, two, one. There we go. We've got our 36 variables, uh, 36 observations of five variables. We've got block, which reads in as numeric. We know that's not right. It should be a non-ordered factor. We've got traffic, which reads in as a character. That's fine. The passive aggressive butler that is R will uh, usually do the correct thing and convert that on the fly to a factor. Tillage, the same thing. It's a uh, non, um, non-ordered factor. Oh, it, this one could be a, an ordered factor, tillage. So uh, I, I think I did order it in this script just to have a look. OM is a numeric variable. Plot here doesn't contain any information for us. Plot is just a unique, there are 36 unique values of plot. So it, it doesn't um, add anything for us. So I'm going to convert on uh, line 39 here. Um, block to a factor. You can keep your eye up here as I do that. The numeric should change the factor. Three, two, one. Now it's a factor with four levels. I'm going to do the same thing for traffic. Watch up there. Three, two, one. Now it's a factor with three levels, CTF, LTP, and STP. I'm going to change um, tillage to an ordered factor with the order zero shallow depth. Okay, keep your eye up there. Three, two, one. There we go. And I'm just going to kind of have a look at what we get when we do um, the plot, which um, I just confirmed for myself that there were 36 unique variables uh, levels for that. And I, I didn't bother converting it because we won't be using it. OK, I just wanted to look at uh, a summary of the organic matter real quick. Let's just look at the um, central tendency in uh, numerically. I could plot this, but I tend not to do this and I would probably not even look at this, but this one I wanted up because I wanted to look at the interaction plots for the variables. You know I'm a big um, user and uh, I encourage you guys to use this on any linear model, mix effects or not, all the time. We should be looking in this kind of experiment at the interaction plot before we do any any analyses whatsoever. This is an interaction plot that will have the traffic um, variable factor levels on the x-axis and the response the y for all of these will be the dependent variable the organic matter and the trace factor will have uh, the first one i just wanted to look it'll have a different line across traffic for each of the four blocks and uh, if the blocks don't matter we would expect all of those lines to be right on top of one another in whatever shape they might be remember there are three levels so there'll be three means connected by a line let's just have a look at it look in the plot window Three, two, one. Okay, now this doesn't look that good, but it's this is only diagnostic. It doesn't need to look good. We're not going to show it to anyone to impress them. This is OM. I notice along the range of uh, OM, I, that's why I, I had the um, central tendency pointed out. The whole range of the central tendency is, um, well, the range of this is 4.3 to 5.6. And remember these um, these points on these lines are means. Now, if there's not a lot of variation, there are only three dots for each of these means, I believe. Um, if there's not a lot of variation, um, that means that some blocks are having one kind of effect where we go up from CTP up 
to LTP down to SDP, and some are starting up, going down, and going up. So down, up, down for some, up, down, up for others. And the mean, the intercept of those is, is relatively far apart. So already I know diagnostically that block is important here. Let's look at um, tillage as a function of a block. Remember, it's shallow, deep, and zero. Three, two, one. <clears throat> OK, interesting. The intercepts are different, and um, but this time um, uh, the deep tillage has low organic matter, and there's a big variance at zero and a, a you know intermediate variance at, at shallow. So again, we see that block is going to be important here, maybe even an interaction with block. Okay, I think that that's all I did. Although I could also look at the two interaction plots for um, different combinations of tillage and uh, traffic, or the one interaction plot anyway. So um, I wanted to look at the means for what the different blocks are overall, ignoring the two factors, because I know that that's, that's going to be important. So let's just make a plain old box plot. I haven't fancied this up whatsoever. And we do see that the organic matter has a big effect. So already, because I know that the, um, the, um, the basis for what we think about mixed effects is that it should be a, a random effect. <clears throat> we would leave out the random effect if we could, but this suggests to me that we're not going to be able to. Then I've got the eta squared that um, I want to see, and I've done this for block, traffic, and tillage, and we can interpret this as the strength of the effect of variance explained for each of these factors. It's a proportion, as a matter of fact. I'm not going to talk about Cohen's rules of thumb for eta square. We've talked about that many times in here, and we shall again probably. But um, instead, we can just look at the compare the magnitude between block, traffic, and tillage. Here they go down in the console. Three, two, one. <clears throat> now um, I'm not going to bother to explain. Uh, they're all the same anyway for these simple one-factor models, but. Um, we can just look at the uh, a proportion of total variance explained by block because of between uh, or rather within um, level ex um, variance. It's 30% uh, due to block, it's 33% due to traffic, and it's 23% due to tillage. Block is almost imp as important as traffic uh, on this and, um, and, and tillage as well. So we know block is, go on, Martin. Thanks, Ed. I'm obviously being a bit stupid here, I think, but the traffic value is 0 0.03 and the block value is 0.3. Yeah, you're right. Traffic has no, yeah, you're right. I just misread it and I forgot the story as I was doing it live. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. There's almost no variance explained by traffic. Of course, if we go back and uh, look at the traffic, um, yeah. That makes sense because if we average these four lines together at each of those points, it's almost a straight line. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. That's exactly right. That falls out in the models here in just a second. Go on, Perjmec. We only have a couple of minutes, so I want to get to the end, but go on quickly. Yeah, okay. Uh, I can just uh, quickly uh, remark that um, in my uh, in my GPR data that come from the same uh, site, uh, the effect of block is also that is block is almost easier detected than any other thing I wanted to detect, so it sort of makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and the other one is that uh, traffic is a specific, um, um, it's a quite a particular uh, factor here because it makes sense for the whole plot only. I will be very stubborn and repeat it every time because I talked to, to Magda and talked to some other persons about that. Um, traffic is a pattern of traffic that makes only sense on the spatial scale of a plot. So it's only uh, aggregation level plot. Uh, when you take a sample from one particular place on um, the plot, uh, the only thing that counts from the traffic is the amount of traffic falling on that uh, on that place. So, but it's an intricacy in this particular uh, design of experiment. Yeah, thank you for saying that. But, um, but uh, <clears throat> on the evidence here, 
traffic is almost not important at all, at least in explaining variation for this experiment. But uh, yeah, with with more detailed spatial evidence, we could tease it out possibly. Okay, thanks for saying that, Martin, because this really aligns our thoughts. And let me say this a little differently now. The block is the most important source of variation. Let's make a box plot of uh, traffic and tillage. This is a better box plot with a strip chart. You know I like those. I'll go ahead and draw the axes uh, as well, and even a legend. This is deep, shallow, zero. The three box are um, <coughs> C, TF, LTF, and STP. I haven't tried to order them in any way. And we can see that there, it looks like there's a, a big average difference of tillage. We know the block is important. This averages everything over the block. And so we see some really big um, um, boxes here, middle 50% of the data. But also just look at the spread. And uh, we're estimating what the central tendency is here, but we only have a few points to do it. So I'm not gonna belabor that point, but then that is what we're working with. I've got a few models that I wanna compare. I'm gonna do this relatively quickly because we're, we're out of time. The first one is a mixed effects model with a fixed, um, um, a random effect rather of block. So, uh, and no interaction effect. I don't think we have the sample size for an interaction effect, but I did look at it anyway. So this is our first linear mixed effects model. This is a plot of the variance. Um, it, it's not perfect, but the sample size is low. And to me, this is acceptable. I'm not gonna belabor that because we talk about that quite a lot in here. In the summary, um, we've got, I'm not going to linger on this, but um, what I will look at up here is in the random effects. And uh, the way we evaluate random effects is uh, it's the proportion of variance compared by the random factor uh, compared to the total variance. So 0.43 um, divided by uh, 0.043 divided by 0 0.07 plus 0.043. So, you know, we're talking about around 30%, <clears throat> like we um, like we already calculated with the ETA. All right, so um, if we just look at the old-fashioned ANOVA um, test of the overall effects, tillage and traffic, we see that traffic falls out as not, not significant, and not surprisingly, we get the um, a significant effect for tillage. And this is controlling for the variation between the, uh, the blocks. And if we if we use this um, plot underscore model from um, from the um, from this nice LSR or um, SJ plot package, it shows an effect size plot, which is it's pretty hot actually. Let's just have a look at it. <clears throat> so this is the effect size of the contrasts. So this is a linear model contrast table, and really just to get to the um, to the um, um, end of it, uh, we, yeah, it just shows the significant effect, but it also shows the contrast from the, the arbitrary baseline of the tillage. Okay, I did compare the model with a interaction effect, even though I don't think there's quite um, the sample size and statistical power to legitimately do this. Uh, I talked in here a few times about rules of thumb if we don't do a power analysis for these. The rule of thumb for um, regular linear models in block designs like this is around three replicates per main effect. We just tested two main effects with only four um, replicates. So if we add another one with the interaction effect, it, it exacerbates that problem. We'll have even less statistical power, but nonetheless, I ran it anyway. And uh, we look at the um, the um, R squared. It's about the same as the R squared um, um, for the for the other model. I'm not going to plot it. It looks similar. Um, but instead, I I wanted to um, compare the uh, two mixed effects models statistically. They're not different. So we would we would even if we were doing model building, we would drop the interaction effect anyway but we do have low statistical power. The other one that I added in here, I'm just going to move it down in the script um, so that it's in a place I like better conceptually, is uh, I did also test a, a plain old 
linear effects model using um, block as a this time as a fixed effect. So this is an all fixed effects model. Have a couple of issues with this way. It's less preferable to conceptually to me than the random effects model. I, I didn't do this before when I met with you, Anna, but thinking about today and thinking about um, the overall concept of what we're doing here, what we expect to see here, we don't we don't have any interest in those blocks per se, but what we expect to see here, we know that the effect size for block was we already examined it explicitly. We know it's it's really big. So this is going to be significant. Probably um, the um, the um, traffic is going to be um, um, uh, significant as well. So let's just have a look at that. I'm going to create the model. Three, two, one. Look at the uh, just. Let's look at the ANOVA to cut it to the chase. Uh, so I'm uh, not traffic, rather the tillage um, also falls out as as uh, just like it did in the previous model, falls out as significant. The block falls out as highly significant uh, as well. And traffic stays the same. You know, conceptually, we get similar information here. From the mixed effects model, we had already identified from the effect size and from the amount of variance explained that uh, it was very important. And we statistically controlled on the effect of uh, of the prediction for OM across the other treatments. So why couldn't we just use this? It's simpler. Here's why. The reason we would still prefer the mixed effects model is that um, if we were to go and make predictions based on this model compared to the um, the um, the random um, block effect in the mixed effects model. The, uh, because we statistically control for that variance in block, of course, assuming that that is a fair estimate of variance across any blocks we might sample, uh, we would make accurate predictions, whereas uh, we wouldn't make accurate predictions here. We wouldn't be able to because um, block is uh, a nonsensical uh, factor. We actually don't care about block four or block three, unless there is some reason, for some reason I can't imagine what the reason would be, you actually were interested in the difference between, say, block four and the other blocks for for the rest of humanity. Uh, there, there wouldn't be a reason for that. We all would want to make an inference, but that's the difference. That's all I've got. We're out of time. Quick questions. Any quick questions? <laughs> I think this was really good, Ed. I feel like there's a lot of this stuff that was in uh, in my masters and seeing the code and how it all comes together. Yeah, I think it's really helpful. I think talking about this stuff really helps. Um, if, if, if you, uh, some of you may have even noticed this, nobody's, been, nobody, uh, or maybe you've been too polite to say it, but I like to try different ways of explaining the same concept using different words, different examples. We, we all do that as, as teachers. But if you ask three different statisticians to explain uh, linear mixed effects models and what the random effect is, you would probably get three different answers, but you'd probably learn more than had you just asked one. And I think it actually would bear repeating doing this every once in a while on different data sets and talking about different things. That's, that's all we've got. If there are no questions, I'm going to stop the recording. Thank everyone for coming. And um, Magda, would you just let me know if uh, what the verdict is 